today is again talk about something that although I've been interested in it conceptually for a while, we have really only focused on for the last few years. And I'm not going to give you a definitive description of a biological process, but instead I'm going to try to summarize for you our current thinking about um, a very perplexing problem, the problem of how synapses are built. So um, let me introduce the subject before I tell you in more detail what I'm actually going to talk about. We all know the brain is pretty complex. It's a vast organ, billions of neurons, trillions of neurons connected each by thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of synapses that basically create vast overlapping networks. Compare that to the human genome. It's obvious that the human genome is relatively simple in design. It's relatively small. There's only 10 to the 9 or so base pairs of DNA, much of which is repetitive. But you all know that we don't really understand the human genome at this point. People are working on it very intensely, but I think it will be a while until we understand it. So that gives you a perspective of how complex an understanding of the brain will be. There's a general agreement, however, that neural circuits govern brain function. Although people in neuroscience basically fight about everything, not only money, but also how to think about the brain, most people would agree that the concept of neural circuits is the unifying idea where everybody can sort of talk to each other. A neural circuit is actually a conceptually simple idea that turns out to be not as simple as it looks. What you see here schematically is a microcircuit in brain, typical microcircuit of feet forward inhibition, where the left pyramidal neuron forms synapses with both a downstream pyramidal excitatory neuron and an inhibitory neuron that then inhibits the same neuron that's also excited by this upstream neuron. These synapses are junctions that connect neurons into circuits that transfer information between the neurons and that process and change that information. Synapses are the fundamental computational unit of the brain. They change information. Synapses differ. They differ depending on the nature of the pre- and the postsynaptic neuron in a way whereby the presynaptic Specializations are actually different even if they come from the same neuron depending on the postsynaptic neuron. As a result, you can even for a simple circuit such as this one not predict or calculate what the input-output relations of these circuits are, i.e. you cannot actually predict how this neuron is going to fire in response to excitation of that neuron because Depending on the properties of these synapses, you could either have, in response to a burst of action potentials on the presynaptic side, an increasing response on the postsynaptic side, or a decreasing response. And there's many variations of this. In other words, a new circuit is functionally built of the connections, where these connections are, how many there are, and equally importantly, of the properties of these connections, especially the plasticity of synaptic connections. We call the overall process that determines where synapses form and what properties they have, synapse formation. And this is schematically shown here, where synapse formation is in this box and is conceptually divided into the initiation of the synaptic contact, the organization of its canonical components, and the specification of its properties that are diverse. 
Synapsation happens throughout life, although it's most active in the early postnatal period. Upstream of synapse formation, obviously neurons have to be made, neurogenesis, and they have to develop axons and dendrites. These processes are largely restricted during development. There's very little of that after development. There's a few areas of the brain where you have continuous adult neurogenesis, but it mostly happens during development. The plasticity, the reorganization of synaptic connections all happens at the level of synapse formation. And there's a continuous balance between synapse elimination, which is poorly understood, and the actual formation process. The major question that I would love to understand better is how synapses are formed mechanistically. What are the molecules, what is their molecular logic, if you want to call it that, that determines where synapses are formed, how their properties change, how synaptic plasticity occurs, broadly speaking. This is the central point of our work at this stage of my career. And the ideas that guide us are based on the fact that synapses are intercellular junctions. As you know, in a body there's intercellular junctions among your different type types. Synapses are well, just one variant of such intercellular junctions, but with a special difference, which is that as intercellular junctions, synapses are asymmetric. You have a presynaptic site that signals, that releases chemical messages that are recognized by the postsynaptic site. Nevertheless, we think it's plausible to postulate that just like other junctions, synapses develop based on the intercellular interactions of adhesion molecules. Adhesion molecules are not primarily mechanical uh, elements, but they are signaling molecules, and that surface receptors represented by cell adhesion molecules are activated by this interaction and that they stimulate an intracellular signal which then organizes subcellular structures. We think that this is what happens not only during the development of synapses but also continuously throughout life during synaptic plasticity and that synaptic plasticity is just an extension or a component of synapse formation. Many candidate cell adhesion molecules have been described, some of which are shown here. On the left side are presynaptic cell adhesion molecules, on the right side are postsynaptic ones. This is my view, there are some people who don't quite agree, I don't know why. Um, anyway, be that as it may, it's obvious that there's a lot of molecules. There are hub molecules such as neurexins, as shown here, or large type P PTPRs. And there's a large number of postsynaptic molecules that these presynaptic molecules interact with. Although all of these proteins have been described sometimes even in great detail, for most of these proteins we don't understand what they do. So people always declare that they're involved in some way in synapse formation, but that doesn't really tell you much because it's a complex process what we really need to know is what do they exactly do? What are they useful for? <coughs> Which ones are actually important? What do they regulate? What do they mediate? How do they do it? And which ones are bystanders, are basically actually may do minor stuff? I'm not going to try to go through all of this. I'm not going to try to give you a grand summary here because I don't have any. Instead, I'm going to focus on just two families of proteins, and specifically I'm going to focus most of my talk on neuroligands, which were discovered as postsynaptic ligands of neurexins some years ago. And I'm also just for balance going to tell you at the end a little story about latrophilins to show you the diversity of interactions, the diversity of mechanisms that exist. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. And each of these sections, or most of these sections, are very, very short, so don't worry. Lunch will be still possible. 
So I'm first going to just tell you a little bit what are new religions. I'm then going to talk about their fundamental roles. I'm going to discuss specific functions of different new religions. And finally, I'm going to tell you about one latre filler as a sort of contrast point. OK, so let's start at the beginning. We cloned new axons 25 years ago because at that time, the focus of my laboratory was to work on neurotransmitter release. And there were cloned as receptors for alpha latrotoxin, a toxin of black widow spider that elicits massive neurotransmitter release. It turns out that neurexins are cell surface proteins that come in three variants, alpha neurexins, complex domain structure, beta neurexins, from, transcribed from an internal promoter, very simple domain structure, and neurexin 1 gamma, which lacks most extracellular sequences. There's three genes that have these independent promoters for alpha and beta neurexins, for neurexins 1, 2, and 3, and for gamma neurexin for neurexin 1. They're localized to synapses, as shown here in this confocal image, where neurexin 1 is co-localized with a presynaptic marker piccolo, and a postsynaptic marker HOMA, illustrating that they're presynaptic molecules. There have been hundreds of gene mutations, especially in neurexin 1, that have been associated with autism, schizophrenia, and as a matter of fact, Tourette syndrome, suggesting that heterozygous dysfunction of neurexin 1 predisposes to neuropsychiatric disease. Neurexins are subject to extensive alternative splicing that has very interesting functional importance which I'm not going to discuss today. And finally, not surprisingly, there are multiple diverse transsynaptic ligands. And this is where neuroligands come in. What you see here in the slide schematically is a sort of a subset of these ligands. You can see the neurexins now on the left side, the presynaptic side. And they interact, among others, with all these ligands in a splice site dependent manner, such as dystroglycan, Cerebellans, LRTMs, and neuroligands. Of these neuroligands were described first, they are evolutionarily conserved, just like with neurexins, and they interact with them in a nanomolar, with a nanomolar affinity. We don't actually understand precisely how these different ligands compete for each other, with each other for binding to neurexins. They function, serve to create something what I call a dynamic interaction network because the specific affinities are regulated by alternative splicing and levels. I'm not going to talk about that aspect, but it's important in understanding the dynamics of synapses, the plasticity of synapses, to realize that changes in alternative splicing or in the levels of various isoforms have profound effects on which proteins directly interact at any given time with presynaptic neurexins. Arguably, neuroligands are the most important neurexin ligands because they're evolutionarily conserved. There's four neuroligand genes in mammals. They're highly homologous, and they're composed, as shown here, of a single extracellular domain that is homologous to esterases, but are catalytically inactive and that dimerizes constitutively. The neurexin neuroligand complex spans the synaptic cleft. What you see here is a structure we obtained some years ago in collaboration with Axel Brungers and Demet Arax Labs. And you can see that in this case, neurexin 1 beta and neuroligand 1 form this transsynaptic complex where the dimerization of neuroligand 1 causes two neurexins to bind across the synaptic cleft. <coughs> neuroligands and other neurexin ligands are primarily but not exclusively expressed in neurons. This is a subject that has become important recently because there have been high-profile papers in Nature and others that were based on this observation, primarily from Ben Barris's lab, suggesting and this was based on bulk isolation of cell types, that neuroligands may actually be expressed primarily 
in non-neuronal cells. As you can see here, the levels are highest in OPCs and sometimes higher in astrocytes. Look at this little expression in neurons of Neuroligan 1 in these studies. However, recent single-cell RNA-seq studies performed by a number of laboratories, including those two illustrated here, give you a completely different picture in that different types of neurons express different levels of different neuroligands, but that the levels of neuroligands are generally highest in neurons, as you would expect from the immunocytochemistry. It is interesting that even for an abundant proteins like neuroligands, Expression patterns are actually not easily resolved and different people get different results with ostensibly plausible approaches. I think that unbiased single-cell RNA-seq is probably one of the better methods to do this, but strikingly, even different RNA-seq studies, single-cell RNA-seq studies, give sometimes quite different results for the same cell types. So this is a problem that I think we all face and that we cannot just resolve by saying one is right and the other one is wrong, but in the end can only be addressed by clean genetics. So what I want to do now after this introduction is tell you a little bit about the fundamental roles of neuroligands. In order to address this, some time ago, we generated triple knockouts, conditional triple knockouts, one, two, three, initially, and later on quadruple knockouts. The initial studies didn't include a neuroligand four, because neuroligand 4 turns out in mice to be restricted to very few synapses and expressed at extremely low levels. What you see here is that in these initial studies, just simply knocking out all three abundant neuroligands, in this case in hippocampal neurons, had no effect on synapse numbers or synapse size. And this was measured both by using immunocytochemistry for excitatory synapses and for inhibitory synapses as shown in this slide here, suggesting that neuroligands are not essential for the formation of synapses. However, using the same type of approach, but now contrasting either the global deletion of neuroligands in all neurons or the sparse deletion in only relatively small, few postsynaptic neurons, shown here on the left and right respectively, revealed that the neurexin neuroligand deletions had profound effects on synaptic transmission. In the global conditional knockout, both excitatory and inhibitory synaptic transmission and in excitatory synaptic transmission, both GABA, both AMPA receptor and NMDA receptor mediated synaptic responses were significantly impaired. The same was observed for sparse deletion, suggesting that neuroligands are essential, globally speaking, for synaptic transmission, but not for the actual generation of synapses. We observed a similar conclusion in vivo using cerebellum. The way how we did this is shown here on the left. Oops. On the left, you see mRNA measurements of the cerebellum, just to illustrate that cerebellum four, uh, neuroligand 4 is almost undetectable. These are the other three neuroligands. We took the phlox triple knockout mice, shown on the right, and crossed them with l 7 p mice that express cre recombinase only in Purkinje cells, and then analyzed synapses on the Purkinje cells. What we found is that there was an effect on synapse numbers that was relatively modest, as shown here, there was an effect specifically on VGLU2 positive puncta that are, represent climbing fiber synapses coming from the inferior olive, as you can see here. And this effect was largely restricted to the distal synapses of the climbing fibers, which represent about less than 10% of the total synapses. So the actual decrease in synapse numbers was relatively small. What you see here on the right is that not only the density of synapses, but also the size of the clusters was impaired, so the synapses were smaller. On the other hand, we glued one positive synapses, which are the much more abundant parallel fiber synapses, were completely unchanged, probably because in these synapses, cerebellans are the dominant neurexin ligands. 
This change in synapse numbers was confirmed by electron microscopy showing that these synapses are indeed smaller. So the new ligand knockout caused a change in parallel fiber synapse, in climbing fiber synapses that was dramatic based on these morphological data. When we looked at inhibitory synapses, as shown here in the cerebellum, again, inhibitory synapses on Purkinje cells, we found the opposite. There was an increase in synapse density and there was an increase in synapse size. Paradoxically, though, thus, there was a change in synapses, just morphologically, that was a small but significant and restricted loss of climbing fiber synapses, no change in parallel fiber synapses, and an increase in size and density of inhibitory synapses. And again, the size increase was confirmed by electron microscopy as shown here. So the question obviously arises is that associated with the change in function, in order to address this, we performed classical slice physiology, recorded from Purkinje cells and stimulated separately climbing fiber inputs that form climbing fiber synapses and parallel fiber inputs that form parallel fiber synapses. We also analyzed stellar cells that I don't have time to go into, as well as glia that I also don't have time to go into. The bottom line is that climbing fiber EPSCs were impaired significantly, as shown here. This impairment reflected a change in synapse efficacy without a change in release probability as measured by the PPR, the paired pulse ratio, an indirect measure of release probability, and did not reflect the change in synapse elimination. In other words, the number of synapses, the number of climbing fiber that innervated the single Purkinje cells, which is always one, was unchanged. So this perfectly corresponds to the morphological data suggesting that indeed, in the postsynaptic Purkinje cell, neural ligands are selectively essential for one type of synapse, but not another type of excitatory synapse, and that this essential contribution is reflected by a loss of function in a decrease of synapse function and synapse structure. What about inhibitory synapses that were morphologically increased? Here, we observed an even more dramatic impairment of function. In fact, most of the inhibitory synaptic transmission was gone. As you can see here, this impairment is reflected also in a decrease in mini frequency, but interestingly, in a decrease in amplitude as well, consistent with a decrease in synapse size, suggesting that with the, well, not consistent with the, there was an increase in synapse size, um, suggesting that what is happening here is that the morphological observation of an increase in synapse density and synapse size for inhibitory synapses is actually not at all indicative for what really happens, but reflects possibly a, a compensatory change that supposedly is a reaction to the loss of synaptic function, to a loss of postsynaptic response, to a loss of the presynaptic, postsynaptic junction in transmitting information. So one bottom line here is that neural ligands are essential for synaptic transmission, but not for synapses as such that they operate in manner specific for different types of synapses, even when expressed in the same postsynaptic neuron, and that the numbers of synapses you see morphologically and their size is not at all predictive of what these synapses really look like, what they actually are. In fact, it can be quite misleading. So these experiments thus gave you us a baseline for what neural ligands actually do. But they don't act, tell us what they really do. And in fact, when we initially worked on neural ligands some time ago, we thought because they're so highly homologous that they would all do the same thing and that they would be redundant. This is why we first analyzed triple and quadruple knockouts. Later on, as I will tell you now, we came to, came to realize that despite the fact that they're highly homologous, they're totally different functionally. They do completely different things, each one of the four neural ligand genes, in a manner that we would not have predicted and we before and that we currently do not yet understand. 
However, this is the conclusion that I'm going to illustrate with you, for you now in this next section of my talk in which we try to analyze each individual neural ligand. We first did this in culture because everything is a lot easier in culture. So we performed the same analyses of excitatory AMPA receptor and NMDA receptor mediated transmission as well of inhibitory synaptic transmission separately in neural ligand one, two, and three knockouts. I'm not gonna go through the details here. Suffice it to say that the overall results were rather disappointing and that there were phenotypes, but they didn't really help us most strikingly, we saw no phenotype, for example, for neuroligand 3 conditional knockouts, despite the fact that neuroligand 3 is quite abundant. So we decided to pursue in vivo analyses, and we did this in a variety of preparations and variety of systems. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. Instead, I picked for each neuroligand just a few spotlights to give you an illustration of what the overall conclusions were so that you can get an impression of the flavor of what sort of came out of this, what the conclusions, uh, what kind of conclusions emerged. First, gonna tell you about hippocampus. In these experiments, we performed in vivo manipulations using stereotactic injections of viruses. These were injected at P0 or P21. I'm gonna show you the P21 data. They were sparse. So only a few neurons in the sections were actually infected. We analyzed this neuron, these neurons two weeks after the in vivo injections by cutting slices and recording from the neurons as shown here. The recording configuration is shown here where we basically recorded from adjacent infected and non-infected cells to allow a perfect control for manipulated and non-manipulated cells in the same sections. You can then plot these results as shown here as a relation between infected versus non-infected in the same pairs in the same slices. And what you see here immediately, and as summarized on the right, is that there may be a trend for a decrease in AMPA receptor mediated responses for the neuroligand one knockout. That is not significant, but there is a massive decrease in NVA receptor responses. So the neuroligand one knockout had a specific phenotype in that synaptic strength mediated by AMPA receptors in vivo was not significantly changed, but NMDA receptor responses were dramatically decreased, a very discrete functional effect. There was no change in synapse numbers, not surprisingly. So we wondered whether this deletion that was initially carried out in triple knockouts or quadruple knockouts even, as shown here, was actually specific for neuroligand one. I got ahead of myself here a little bit. So we performed the same analysis again and for neuroligand one, now as NMDA R, AMPA R ratios. And as you can see here again, triple knockouts, there's this decrease in, AM, in the NMDA AMPA ratio. That's also present for the neuroligand one knockout, but not as a control for the neuroligand three knockout. There's no change in paired pulse ratio. The bottom line here is, as I already concluded, that neuroligand one is selectively essential in excitatory synapses in vivo for NMDA receptors, at least in the CI1 parameter neurons, suggesting that it has a very specific restricted function. And this is developmentally independent. It happens at P0 as much as P21. What consequences does that have for NMDA receptor mediated LTP? As you know, these are the standard neurons in which LTP is analyzed. This is where LTP was discovered, NMDA receptor mediated LTP was discovered, and it is thought to be a major mechanism of synaptic plasticity. So we did the same analyses for LTP. And what you see here is again on top the triple knockout after conditional deletion in isolated neurons. Here's the neuroligand one knockout, and here's the neuroligand three knockout. These are just exemplary experiments. And you can see that the neuroligand deletion of either neuroligand one or triple deletion causes a loss, pretty much a complete loss of LTP, whereas the neuroligand three deletion has no effect. So you have a partial decrease in NMDA receptor responses, a total decrease in, amber, in LTP. As it turns out, these two effects are independent of each other. 
because you can elicit LTP by mechanisms, that, by manipulations that are NMD receptor dependent, independent, simply by increasing a calcium. And using this approach, we showed that the neuroligin 1 knockout also impairs this. So neuroligin 1 in the hippocampus does com two completely different things that are both very discreet. It's essential for LTP. It's essential for normal NMD receptor levels. But it's not essential for anything else that we measure, suggesting that it shapes synapse properties in a very specific and limited manner. What about neuroligin 2? Let me now talk to you about neuroligin 2. And we first, I'm first going to tell you in cortex what phenotypes we found. And in this case, the molecular manipulation is different. Here, we are having conditional neuroligin 2 knockout mice, and we manipulate not just sparsely one neuron, but instead, we are using AIVs, I don't know, associated virus, that infect all cells, glia and neurons, and express Cre recombinase or a control in all cells, neurons and glia. And then we measure synaptic responses. What we find is that there was a loss, quite profound loss, of inhibitory synaptic transmission, but not excitatory synaptic transmission. This is illustrated on the left in many recordings where both the frequency and amplitude of MIPSCs were severely impaired, similar to what I showed you in the Cervella triple knockout knot, whereas the EPSC amplitude was completely unchanged. We also performed input-output curves of re in response to extracellular stimulation. What we found was that there was a selective decrease in inhibitory responses, but not excitatory responses. These experiments thus show that neuroligin 2 is selectively essential for inhibitory responses, has no effect on excitatory responses, has no effect on NMDA or AMPA-mediated responses. This is actually important because there's a controversy in the field. A recent Nature paper um, using RNAi showed that glial neuroligin 2 loss of function selectively impairs the excitatory synapses, which in our previous paper we actually never found. So there is a typical illustration of these kinds of contradictions that come up over and over again in our field. Probably not only in our field. OK, let me move on and give you another example basically of the same thing, which is the neuroligin 2 deletion in cell Bella Purkinje cells. Now the single deletion using l 7 cre The bottom line is that it's very similar. We see no change in punctal density. We see no change in climbing fiber thin EPSCs. But we see a dramatic decrease in inhibitory synaptic transmission, as shown here, without a change in PPR, i.e. this change in inhibitory transmission. This impairment in inhibitory synaptic function is not due to a change in release probability. So again, in the same postsynaptic neuron, different neuroligands perform completely different functions. They have different functional and non-overlapping activities. Note that this inhibitory synapse phenotype is different from the inhibitory synapse phenotype of all neuroligands. It turns out that other neuroligins do contribute to inhibitory function, but in a non-overlapping manner. Let me move on to neuroligin 3. For some time, we couldn't find a real function for neuroligin 3 in experiments that I partly already showed you. There was little phenotype. Over the years, we expanded these studies, and what I'm going to show you now are two examples which illustrate that they have a profound role in regulating synaptic transmission, both in excitatory and inhibitory synapses, but in a very specific manner. What you see here is a diagram of a pyramidal neuron in the hippocampus CA1 region and two types of basket neurons. These are inhibitory cells, the interneurons that form synapses on the soma. They form synaptic syna somatic synapses, the PV basket cells and the CCK basket cells. We first analyzed this synapse here formed by CCK basket cells 
And what we found is illustrated here using paired recordings, where you basically patch both the pre- and postsynaptic neuron in the same slice and record from them at the same time, or rather stimulate one and record from the other, that when we knocked out neuroligin 3, there was in fact not a decrease, but an increase in synaptic transmission, as shown here, both measured by the IPSC amplitude and by the success rate of simulations, demonstrating that the knockout created an increase in synaptic strength, not a decrease. The obvious question is why? What's interesting in this synapse is that this synapse here is characterized by very high levels of presynaptic CB1 endocannabinoid receptors that are presumably stimulated by postsynaptically produced endocannabinoids. So the obvious hypothesis was that maybe there's a disinhibition of endocannabinoid signaling because endocannabinoids are generally inhibitory. They're produced postsynaptically to put this depressed presynaptic neurotransmitter release. It turns out that there's two types of endocannabinoid signaling. Phasic signaling, which you probably heard about, where you have the phenomenon of DSI or ILTD. It's basically an activity-dependent inhibition of synaptic transmission. Tonic endocannabinoid signaling, on the other hand, happens continuously and is activity-independent. The phenotype that I showed you is consistent with the loss of tonic endocannabinoid signaling because we didn't actually stimulate these synapses in particular patterns. We just recorded from them. This can be tested. What we did again in paired in intercellular recordings as well as upon extracellular stimulation is test the effect of inhibiting CB1 receptors with AM251. What you see here is that in the wild type, where there is no loss of neuroligin 3, inhibition of CB1 receptors almost doubles the iPSC response. So it disinhibits the iPSC response, it disinhibits tonic endocannabinoid signaling. There was no effect on the neuroligin 3 knockout, demonstrating that tonic endocannabinoid signaling is operating in the wild type synapses, but that the neuroligin 3 knockout by an unknown mechanism, actually we now think it's beta neurexins that are the mechanism, inhibit this endotonic signaling and thereby disinhibit the synapse, leading to an increased synaptic strength. Phasic endocannabinoid signaling, on the other hand, was normal, showing that endocannabinoid synthesis itself was perfectly present, and this is shown in this slide here. So this illustrates this one synapse in which the neuroligin 3 knockout has a specific role not in fashioning the synaptic strength as such, but in affecting or disinhibiting endocannabinoid signaling, tonic endocannabinoid, but not phasic endocannabinoid signaling. In other words, neuroligin 3 is essential for this synapse to have one particular property. It specifies the synapse in this one property. Let me tell you about another synapse that is just adjacent to this one. It's basically in the same circuit. But it shows that neuroligin 3 can have different results depending on which specific synapse we're talking about. What I'm now going to tell you about is excitatory synapses that are on PV basket cell neurons, which are different from CCK neurons. As you can see, they have different colors. This excitatory synapses on here are important because PV interneurons are thought to drive hippocampal oscillations. So we analyzed these synapses also as a function of the neuroligin 3 conditional knockout. And what you see here on top is again input-output curves for this particular preparation showing that in these PV interneurons, when neuroligin 3 is deletion, there's also a disinhibition or at least an enhancement of responses. This is actually quite large, this enhancement. Okay. And this enhancement is correlated with a change in paired pulse release ratio, suggesting that it's a change in release probability. This was also confirmed using a technique called MK801 that I'm not going to explain to you because we don't have time, but I'd be happy to discuss. <laughs> 
So the neuroligand 3 knockout and this particular synapse again increases neurotransmitter release. It increases neurotransmitter release by increasing the release probability and the effect is actually larger than the effect I showed you for the inhibitory CCK neurons. So what is the mechanism? The first guess we had was obviously that the mechanism is the same, that you have disinhibition of tonic endocannabinoid signaling. So we looked at this using either an agonist or antagonist for CB1. And what you can see here is that mutant and wild type react exactly identically to the agonist, showing there are actually CB1 receptors that can be inhibited. And they identically react to the antagonist namely not at all, showing that there is no tonic endocannabinoid signaling in this particular synapse. So in other words, at this synapse, the same knockout dis that disinhibits endocannabinoid signaling, tonic endocannabinoid signaling, and an adjacent synapse actually has no effect on tonic endocannabinoid signaling, presumably because it doesn't exist here. However, when we looked at the presynaptic m -blue r receptors, we observed a completely different picture. When we used an agonist to this presynaptic M-blue-R receptors, which are type 3 M-blue-R receptors, there was no effect on the knockout, whereas the wild type was inhibited. So these neurons seem to lack these presynaptic receptors. Moreover, when we used an antagonist, the wild type was disinhibited, but the knockout was not. So in this particular synapse, Neuroligand 3 enhance knockouts enhance neurotransmitter release, just like in the inhibitory synapse, but by a totally different mechanism. It's again a presynaptic receptor mediator mechanism, but the actual mediator, the agent, is totally different, suggesting that neuroligand 3 can have different functions, specify different properties of synapses, depending on where exactly you are in what circuit. This is a recurring theme in that different neuroligands perform distinct functions in the same neuron and they perform different functions in different types of synapses. And this suggests that these are adaptable molecules that have been specialized to different functions that endow synapses with different properties depending on the precise context. So I've told you now a lot about the first three neuroligands. In my last piece of data here, I want to tell you about the fourth neuroligand that's the least abundantly in mice, neuroligand 4. Neuroligand 4, as it turns out, has yet another function. And it turns out that this function in mice seems to be restricted, not to inhibitory neurons as such, but to one particular type of inhibitory neuron, those subtypes of inhibitory neurons that use glycine as a synaptic transmission. This can be analyzed in the MNTB, the medial nucleus of the trapezoid body. And what you see here is that this uh, nucleus contains relatively high levels of neuroligand 4. It, it can be analyzed by patching the postsynaptic neurons. And when you elicit inhibitory responses, they are largely glycinergic, as shown here on the right. In the neuroligand 4 knockout at the synapse, there's a massive decrease in glycinergic synaptic transmission, as shown here, demonstrating that neuroligand 4 is selectively essential for this one because EPSCs were unchanged and GABAergic inhibitory responses were also unchanged. This change or this inhibition or this role of neuroligand 4 at this synapse involves a change in the coefficient of variation, probably because the postsynaptic receptor composition becomes highly variable at these synapses. It's interesting to note that at this synapse too, like any other synapse, other neuroligands also contribute to some extent. When you compare, for example, as shown here, many recordings from neuroligand 4 knockout neurons with quadruple neuroligand 1, 2, 3, 4 knockout neurons, you can see that although the phenotype on the mini on the minis here is significant, it's relatively minor when you analyze minis, probably because most of these minis are GABAergic and not glycinergic. However, in the quadruple knockout, the minis here 
are dramatically impaired, both much more in terms of frequency and in amplitude than in the neuroligand four knockout itself. So this, again, suggests, sort of provides an illustration for the partially convergence of the functions of these neuroligands at similar synapses in despite their disparate or diverse functional properties when you analyze individual synapses at high resolution. So what I've told you then is that multiple neuroligands contribute to the function of a synapse. They contribute to the function of the synapse not by mediating synapse formation. They're not essential for synapse numbers. They have very few effects on synapse numbers, but they contribute in diverse manners to endow synapses with distinct properties. And this is crucial for understanding circuits because circuits depend as much on the specification of synapses, on the properties of these synapses, as they do on whether there are synapses at all. The specification of synapses really shapes input-output relations of synaptic connections. What I want to do now in the last five minutes, before you can all go to lunch, is <coughs> to talk to you about a contrasting molecule, the latrophilins. And this molecule is very interesting. It was actually discovered originally also because it was reported to bind alpha latotoxin and it was thought to be presynaptic. In fact, in most papers, you will see that it is referred to as a presynaptic protein. As I will show you, however, it's is entirely postsynaptic, has nothing to do with the presynaptic terminal. So this molecule is interesting because latrophilins belong to the class of adhesion GPCRs. Adhesion GPCRs are a family of GPCRs in the human genome. I think there's 33 genes, mammalian genome, and they're characterized by being a kind of a hybrid. They have a classical GPCR domains in the membrane, but a collection of extracellular adhesion domains that occupy a very large sequence extracellularly. All adhesion GPCRs share one feature, and that feature is that they're subject to autoproteolysis at a GPS, which is a GPCR proteolysis sequence, which is an intrinsic part of a larger domain, the gain domain. Some years ago, Again, in collaboration with Axel Brünger and Demet Arg, we obtained crystal structures of this domain from multiple cell adhesion GPCRs. And it turns out that this is an autonomously folded domain in which the proteolysis site is sort of embedded in the domain. And after proteolysis, the two parts don't separate. They stick together, stay together. Like in many other examples of extracellular proteolysis, that you observe in many other proteins. The purpose of this extracellular proteolysis remains unknown, even though it's shared by all adhesion GPCRs. Latrophilins bind to multiple extracellular ligands that are presumably transsynaptic interactors. These include a family of tenuins which are evolutionarily conserved, complex, and very interesting molecules that have been implicated in developmental processes, neuroaxins, and FLIRTs, yet another family of cell adhesion molecules. All of these interactions are capable of forming transcellular inter adhesion. So they basically adhere cells together and they mediate the formation of junctions suggesting that they're capable, just like neurexins and neuroligans, of basically bridging the synaptic cleft and connecting pre- and post-synaptic site together and mediating signaling in a bidirectional manner. What is interesting in the case of latrophilins is that they seem to be able to interact with multiple molecules at the same time. Moreover, these other molecules in turn interact yet with other molecules. To illustrate this, we performed structural studies and showed that indeed there are 
complexes that contain multiple components at the same time. So the question then arises, where are these lateral fillings localized and what do they do? Given that they bind to at least some proteins that are thought to be synaptic, it would be hypostate that they should be synaptic. And before we started, we thought they would be presynaptic because they were thought to be latotoxin receptors. To explore this question, we generated new tools using gene targeting. I'm only going to tell you about latrophilin 2. What we did is we generated molecules that have a tag, an M venous tag, in the cytoplasmic tail. All of this can be manipulated conditionally. We can basically include or exclude the tag depending on the exact genetic conditions. This allows us to analyze the molecule both in terms of its localization and in terms of its function. We generated conditional knockout mice as well as conditional knock-in mice to compare them in terms of their survival. And what we found, as shown here, is that the conditional knock-in mice, as demonstrated by the survival of offspring from heterozygous matings, are perfectly normal in terms of survival. You see here that the homozygous knock-in knock-ins are just as abundant as the wild-type homozygous. There's no difference. However, the, condition, the constitutive knockout was lethal, demonstrating the latophilin 2 is essential for the survival of the mouse. Latophilin 2 is synaptic. It turns out that it is highly abundant in excitatory synapses. I'm just going to show you this one example in cultured hippocampal neurons where you can see the puncture of latophilin 2 on a MAP2 positive dendrite. So we analyzed its function because obviously we wanted to know what happens if you knock it out. And we first did this in cultured neurons. I'm only going to show you data that involves sparse co-transfection of either CRE or delta CRE with EGFP. Sparse means that less than 5% of the neurons express the CRE or delta CRE, which is the control, so that we can analyze postsynaptic effects, since presynaptic inputs are not affected by this sparse infection. And what we found when we did this was, as shown here for measurements of spine density, that the postsynaptic deletion of neuroligand 2 caused an approximately 45% decrease in spine density. And this was reflected in a decrease similar decrease in synapse density. So different from neuroelegance, the deletion of just one node latrophilin in these cultured neurons caused a loss of synapses. Actually, this was the most profound loss of synapses we've ever seen with a genetic manipulation. These data suggest that latrophilin 2 is essential for the mouse because it doesn't survive if you take it out. And it acts by a postsynaptic mechanism which was surprising to us, but suggested that we and others had gotten it wrong and that this is really a postsynaptic molecule. However, as I mentioned to you earlier, analyses in cultured neurons are limited by the approach and we really need to go in vivo. When you look at sections from the latrophilin M venous knock-in mice, you can see that latrophilin 2 is broadly expressed in many brain areas but in the hippocampus, there's actually a very interesting, unusual distribution in that the only highly abundant for, place where neuroligand 2 is, uh, where latrophilin 2 is, is the sliver. And when you look at this more closely, you will see that this corresponds to a layer of the CA1 region called the stratum lacanosum moleculare. This is illustrated down here in this expansion. This is the stratum lacanosum moleculare. This is the stratum pyramidale. So the latrophilin 2 in the hippocampus is only in the CA1 region in this particular location. Since I showed you it's postsynaptic, this suggests that the CA1 pyramidal neurons express it and selectively target it to this particular dendritic domain of the CA1 neurons. What is interesting here is that this particular stratum in the CA1 region receives input from the entorhinal cortex, synaptic inputs, whereas the other two major strata receive synaptic inputs, shafer collaterals, from the CA3 
pyramidal neurons. So they're differentiated by the synaptic connectivity. So we wondered whether the latophilin 2 knockout would also affect these particular synapses. We used the same approach that I illustrated to you before. In this case, P0 sparse infection with Cre or delta Cre as a control, shown here. Then cut acute hippocampal slices and then analyze them morphologically by imaging or by electrophysiology. And the bottom line, uh, oops, and the bottom line here is that when you look at the spine density and synapse density, it's normal in the stratum aureans and radiatum, but it's decreased by about 60% in the stratum lacanosum molecular when you knock out latophilin 2 postsynaptically. Not surprisingly, this also changes synaptic transmission. What you see here are recordings. This is the recording strategy. What we do here is that we patch a pyramidal neuron, and instead of patching two neurons side by side, as I showed you earlier, we patch only one neuron, but we stimulate two different inputs, Schaffer collaterals, stratum radiatum, and entorhinal cortex, stratum locanosum molecular. We can do that in the same postsynaptic neuron, and then we can compare these inputs. When we do this, we find that in the stratum radiatum, responses are enhanced. The Schaffer collateral responses are actually enhanced. They're not impaired. Presumably, they're enhanced as a compensatory reaction because, as you can see on the right, the inputs from the entorhinal cortex in the stratum lacanosum molecular are severely impaired. So this confirms that the loss of synapses results in a loss of synaptic transmission. So I'm illustrating this to you as a contrast to the whole new ligand story. I only showed you one lot of film. There's three of them. I'm not going to talk about the others. Don't worry. But I'm illustrating this to you that here now we have a molecule that exhibits specificity and that it is selectively targeted to one particular domain in the dendrites and localized to one particular class of synapses where it's essential for these synapses. Not surprisingly, if you impair this, which I haven't shown you, take my word for it, if you impair the latrophilin 2, there's major changes in terms of memory because the m cortex inputs are thought to be involved in especially memory flexibility. So latrophilin 2 is selectively direct synapses to one particular domain of CA1 neuron dendrites, completely different from the functions that I illustrated to you for neuroligands. The mechanisms, I don't know. I presume that it involves binding of the ligands. I hope, for the sake of all the people who work on GPCRs, that it involves GPCR function, but we don't really know that. This is really the subject of our current studies. We're really trying to analyze this. It would be interesting to know if a GPCR can be made specific functionally by putting it into a synapse postsynaptically and how it works. Stay tuned. So, to summarize or conclude, what I showed you here is that latrophilin 2 controls the numbers of a specific subset of synapses as opposed to their properties. Very different from the neuroligands. And where does that leave us? So how do we, can we put all this together? We can't. There is, at this point, too many molecules. We don't understand how all this works. My idea is that all of this will eventually be explained in terms of intracellular signaling, and that we need to take the example of cancer biology and other areas of cell biology as, as a guide for trying to understand how specificity arises in signaling. The purpose of such specificity is clear. You need that type of specificity to create the diversity of synapses within circuits in order to endow circuits with the ability to process complex information and to undergo plasticity, to be subject to activity-dependent changes. The actual molecular logic is something 
that we hope will become clearer as we further dissect these various molecules and in particular as we identify signaling pathways that are intracellular. What I find most striking here is the fact that these molecules operate in a manner whereby the same molecules can have different meaning depending on the type of synapse they are in. In other words, these molecules have different functions depending on the pre-postsynaptic context. If you remember or re that these molecules all have multiple ligands, this makes sense because it's easy to imagine that the precise complexes determined by the affinity and abundance of various ligands determines the actual signaling. And that will be different between different synapses. So it's not surprising that this exists. The way how I like to think about this in a bigger picture, I would like to illustrate in a metaphor. This is a Byzantine mosaic from a villa in the current Iraq. I'm showing this mosaic simply to illustrate the fact that if you look at the mosaic, it looks like there's a tremendous specificity in this whole picture. But if you take out individual stones, they would have zero specificity. In fact, they're all identical, like all these black ones, or all these brown ones, all these white ones. Their specificity, their meaning, completely depends on the other stones surrounding it, the context of the stones. And I think in a synapse, it's the same thing. You're basically defining the molecular mechanisms of individual molecules based on what other molecules are around that. You cannot just look at them in isolation. They're not master molecules that do everything autonomously, but they always cooperate with others. With this, I would like to close sorry, I went over time, um, and uh, mention the major contributors of the studies. These are the more recent people in my lab. Bo Zhang did all the Sabella physiology, all the Sabella imaging that I described for neuroligands. Soham Chandler did all the work on culture on neuroligands. Jay Polipali did the analysis of the neuroligand three in slices together with Chaba Földi. Man Zhang and Ting Wu did the neuroligan 1 analysis in slices, hippocampal slices. And Garrett Anderson and Rick Sando did all the latrophilin work that I discussed. I have wonderful collaborators at Stanford and elsewhere, in particular Rob Malenka, Niels Brose in Göttingen, and Demet Arak, who is at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much for bearing with me. <laughs>